I remember um, how many believe, really believe, that if we lack wisdom, we can ask, and he gives it to us liberally. Well, you'll recall, if you've been here for a while, that um, the town council was saying, no, we could not uh, change this agricultural zoning to institutional. And I plunked before the Lord on my bed, and I was like, okay, I've done everything I know to do. Read my lips. I don't know what to do next. And the Lord put in my heart to change it to, to recreational. It, and it, it was like, believe me, I'm not smart enough to think of that good idea because I don't know a whole lot about zoning. But when he said change it to recreational, uh, when we drew up a plan um, with uh, basketball and uh, soccer and dirt bike trails and the whole works. Um, so that was one hoop we jumped through, and then after we jumped through that hoop, then we changed this five acres, I believe, to this where our church is on, to institutional. So I was wondering, well, what if they do close down our churches again? I thought, well, they're not, they're not closing down sports. Well, I'll just get sports jerseys and sit on two sides of the church and get Doug with his big whiteboard to do up play-by-play -play, uh, street hockey because we're going to play or whatever. And, you know, God will get, make a way where there seems to be no way. And, you know, we need to be, the word says we need to be as wise as, it, as, wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Amen. And so I'll know one thing is that I will come to church and we need church. People need church. There's a, um, it just, uh, they are going to go back to their old way of life and their old habits and their old ways. And life is going to deteriorate. It was, if it was bad before you came to know Jesus, uh, the Bible says if you, if you, the enemy comes and finds that place all swept clean, uh, he's going to take seven worse demons and come in and it's like we're not going to let them uh, take ground that we've all fought so hard to, to fight for and um, I just know the grace of God gets stronger and stronger and stronger when we just do things the Lord's way there's you know God wants a people with a backbone uh, some of you will remember this, that time I preached about grit where are the people with a little bit of grit? If you think times are hard now, it's like, oh my goodness. Uh, one of the things we, I don't know if any of your families did this, but our families came out of Europe. Um, my, our parents were teenagers when, and when they grew up uh, coming out of the Second World War. And a lot of times on the Sunday afternoon, we'd sit around and we'd want to hear the stories of what happened during that time. And Gil's dad, a young teenager, I think he was 19 years old, um, has kind of slid underneath the radar as far as having to... Um, uh, to be in the enlisted, uh, but they were hauling all the young men out of Holland and Poland to make them force them to work in the labor camps. And um, he would lay in the field. He was telling us a story. I was trying to imagine a 19-year-old. He said, you could hear the boys weeping in the fields and because um, they were hungry and cold. But they would have to, we heard the story of him laying there for three days in the mud and seeing the trucks come along with the guns and hiding under the, in the barns and Gil's mom being so frightened because her fiancé was out there. Uh, she never knew where he was and he couldn't tell her where he was hiding uh, because that would jeopardize if they ever came after her and, in, and interrogated her, that would put his life and maybe his brother, etc. And uh, just that was just one little story. Uh, you know, that just one little story. But somehow, um, you know, if you wonder kind of what was wrong with our parents sometimes, they had that stiff upper lip and they had grit and they had work ethic. And uh, I remember my dad's letter when he moved to Canada. He literally thought they were, they came to the Garden of Eden, that you could just get a job and make money and rent a place. They didn't even have a place of their own. And as some of these places that our families lived in looked like they were condemned houses. Uh, but you know what? It's like, how have we become so soft? 
And, and I don't know what's in the future, but we need to be bearing ourselves up. We need to prepare ourselves uh, because we don't know what will happen at one point if we, if we say, judge for yourself whether we should obey God or whether we should obey man. And, you know, in the, in the book of Acts, they were faced with those kind of things. They forbade them to speak any more in the name of Jesus, or they were threatened with imprisonment. And we don't know uh, what, uh, you know, we don't know at what point, but we do know enough about the prophecies to, to know that we're eventually going to be in those end times. And uh, we need to be prepared. And so um, that is why we're, we're going through this series, because the Holy Ghost said, raise up a generation uh, to learn how to take possession. And uh, we can't get soft. It's never say, it, it's like we got to prepare ourselves. Uh, the grace of God will be there. When we, whatever trial we have to be uh, facing, we know that we will have the grace and the strength and the wisdom to get through the times, but we have to prepare ourselves now in the name of Jesus, Father, I believe you that you will give me the grace to handle whatever situation uh, that we come in. So I just give you a little sneak preview of what we're going to do if they say we can't have church. Um, we'll make sure we get some jerseys ordered. Red team, blue team, who cares what color? Amen. We're gonna have uh, we're gonna have strategies on how to play this, and believing that the Lord, many, many, many come to know the Lord in every point in church history. Whenever the the going got tough, the tough got going. Amen. And and uh, a lot of the, in the Second World War, a lot of uh, faith and a lot of momentum was created through the underground workers. And there were children, there were children that were, that, and German Shepherd dogs, and they would, Believe me, they had to go to the Lord for wisdom. How were they going to? Uh, how were they going to have strategy? And so there was a, a big uh, working underground, and moms with their babies and and stuff hidden messages and stuff like that. So it's just like we don't know what what's going to come. But uh, even your children, you shouldn't be shielding them. Our parents didn't shield us from the some of these stories. Uh, but instead prepared us that we're just sojourners on this earth. Amen? And, and we need to know how to take possession. We need to know how to press in and intercede. We need to know how to pray for those who are in authority. We need to know uh, to say, speak, let there be light, and uncover the plans, plots, and schemes of the enemy. It's time to be activated, and we need to activate the body of Christ. This is where it's at. If we don't fight, who else is going to fight? The, the whole world's believing everything that the media says, uh, and the and, uh, there's a whole lot more at stake, and already the Lord is is preparing us to to have wisdom and to know what to do. And so, in this setting, this stage, I didn't intend to uh, go along these lines, but it's it, we don't know where we're heading. I really hope all of this blows away. Wouldn't that be nice? And we could just think, yay, uh, we get to enjoy our summer holidays and live life and and eat eat. And, uh, buy and sell and enjoy our friendships and praise God, maybe we will. But if it is heading into uh, hard times, we need to be prepared. And so this is a word we're going to read um, in Colossians, how to be possessors. Uh, possessors have a new nature. Amen. And I'll tell you, anybody that knew me before Christ, they would, I was just a bit of a scaredy cat. I was afraid of things in the spirit. I was afraid of... You, people coming behind corners. It was like I was, there was a lot of fear in my life. And yet in our new nature, we are as bold as a lion. The new me, I have a new nature. And the word of God wants to tell us the difference of your old nature and your new nature. So you're going to recognize at times that that old nature wants to sneak back at you. Amen. It wants to arise those old fears or, or laziness or whatever it, it might be. So let's, with that in mind, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. I'm just going to back up actually um, to... Two, starting at verse 20. Since you died with Christ... 
to the elementary spiritual forces of the world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to those rules? Verse 1 of chapter 3, since then, so I want you to see the word since, since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God, set your mind on things above, not on earthly things, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory, put to death Therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is, is idolatry, and because of these things, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must rid yourself of all such things as these, the anger, the rage, the malice, the slander, the filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other since you've been taken off. The old self would end with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge of in the image of its creator. Here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. And over all these virtues, Put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity, or as the Passion Translation says, which is the mark of true maturity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your heart, since as members of one body you are called to peace and to be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell in among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through the Psalms, through hymns and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Well, there's a whole lot here. A big passage here, but basically the contrast between our old nature, our old tendencies, our old vices, uh, but then putting on the new nature. And so the first uh, word picture I want to give you is uh, draw your attention to the word since. Uh, it was kind of cute as we had dinner last night. We had um, barbecue, and then William says, since we ate all our supper, can we have dessert now? So since, I go, there's that word since again. Since we already ate all our, our, our main course, can we have dessert? And so here the word, uh, three times this word uh, is since since you died with Christ, and then verse 1 of 3, since you've been raised with Christ, and then uh, later on it's since you have taken off your old self. Oh, I it discovered another one. And then since you are members of the body of Christ. And so what came to my mind is the hinges on a door. If you look at the door, you'll see the, the door swings on hinges. And it, and it opens a, a door to new possibilities. Since Jesus Christ died and went to the cross, since he was raised to newness of life, and you too were buried with him in baptism unto death and raised to newness of life, and since uh, you're now part of the body of Christ, uh, since you've been take, taken off your old self, so what this word since is, is like a game changer. It changes everything, things that used to keep you out before, alienate you, keep you from enjoying the blessing, keep you from being possessors, is now since Jesus Christ has done all that for you and you are in him, now we have the energy and the strength and the grace and the invitation to come into a new realm. 
into a new view, into a new authority. Uh, all the things that Jesus Christ that we celebrate, even as we sang, show us for who you are, Lord Jesus. We need this revelation of all that Jesus Christ did for us so that we could be possessors, so that we could go in and, and with the authority in Jesus' name uh, to take things that Jesus Christ has paid such a great price for. Because we all know he triumphed over the devil uh, making public spectacle over him. Amen. And so it's our job as Christians to enforce that, to possess that, to become possessors of those gates, uh, so to speak. So the word since is a powerful word. Since then, it's a game changer. Amen. And since Jesus Christ has done that, we are now new creations in Christ. And we have a new identity, and we have a new purpose, and we have a new nature. And so we want to concentrate uh, not so much on the old nature, because we're all familiar with that old thing. Unfortunately, it wants to get up out of bed with us every single morning. Amen? As long as we're in the flesh, as long as we still have these bodies, as long as we're, we're, we're still waking up on planet Earth, uh, we get out of bed, and there's these two natures on the inside of us. And each one of us could well describe what the old nature, uh, what it starts talking, it wants to talk first thing in the morning. And if you don't talk first, it's going gonna, it's gonna to talk. Amen? So you never let the devil have the last word. He's going to tell you all kinds of stuff that it's, it's not going to happen. And what makes you think, da 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 da? And it, it, you know, he can just tell you all kinds of bad news. But since we've been new creatures in Christ, we have a new nature. And we have a new, that's why we're told to put on the armor, put on the helmet of salvation. Keep every thought captive and obedient, Lord. Keep me in perfect peace today, whose mind is stayed on you. Fill my heart with your love and your joy. Anoint me with the oil of joy as you anointed Jesus. Amen. Your belt of truth. Holy Spirit, you're the one I'm going to believe. You are leading, guiding me into all truth. You're the one that goes before me. Amen. And so we, we put on our armor and, and we don't let the devil get a word in edgewise. Because otherwise he will. So if someone said, so how are you feeling this morning, Marlene? You know, on every given day we can just say, well, actually today I feel like a Mack truck hit me. And I'm tired, and I'm lazy, and I feel like just da, 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 and everything the flesh could possibly say, uh, we would be, and then that would just give credit to our old nature. Amen? And so I heard this story once. This old Indian guy uh, had lived in the woods for a long, long time. He ran into somebody, and he was telling about the two different natures since he had come to know the Lord. And he says, you know, it's like I got two dogs. I got a black dog and a white dog. And he says, and, and they're bred, they're fighter dogs. And, and the other guy goes, really? He says, well, well, which one wins? He says, the dog I feed the most. You got to keep feeding, amen, every day. Give me this day my daily bread. Every day we reach for the word. The more that's going on in our lives, we reach for the word because his word is a lamp to our feet, a light to our path. Without it, we don't have a light. We don't know where we're going. We don't know what the future looks like. And so we could be given into our fears and we could be given into our old nature and, and they're always going to be talking. You know, one day we're going to celebrate the redemption of our bodies. Glory to God. Woo. Amen. But in the meantime, we got to live since Jesus Christ has done all that. We take hold of all of those promises that are yes and amen. Since Jesus said it, I believe it. Amen. And the next word in verse um, 1 and 2 that I want to draw your attention to is the word set. So it says, set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God and set your mind on things above. And so I've, there's three areas here that literally we have to set our hearts and our minds on. And to make it easy, it says, set your hearts and set your minds and set your, and then it talks about the acting, action actions that follow our belief systems. We're going to act out whatever nature is in charge. We're going to act out. You see, we're either going to act out in the flesh in our old nature, or we're going to act out 
in our new nature and, and with the peace of God ruling and loving others unconditionally, uh, which nature is going to win? The one we feed the most, but we also are told we need to set our hearts. So to make it easy to remember, it's set your hearts and set your hands, um, your hearts and your heads and your hands. Amen? So you set your mind on things above. It's sort of like the, um, I love these uh, cruise control things. Since I have cruise control, I, got, I haven't gotten any tickets. Glory to God. Several years ago, I got a combination of $500, and I thought, that does it. Nope, not doing this. And, and just, I didn't go around driving 140 kilometers, not very often anyways, but um, <laughs> heading, in, <laughs> heading into London on Dundas, it changes from 80 to 60, and there's a, there's a light right there. And so if it's still green and you try to catch it, there's always a cop sitting right there. That was a doozer. Uh, so anyways, cruise control is, is really helps, amen, to keep that old nature. Maybe you can't relate in that area, but you'll, there'll be some area you can relate. And so uh, we have to set, set our cruise control. And we, got, we have the power we have made available in, in our very new natures is to set ourselves, to put our cruise control. Uh, and maybe you have to set it a few times throughout the day. Maybe you have to reset it and reset it again a few times where you're going, whoo, oh no, here, what a, you know, every so often, the one thing about the cruise control is that if, if for a moment there you really want to get past somebody, you can just uh, accelerate and it, it will listen to your actions. You're, it will bypass your cruise control thing. And so in the spirit, in the spirit realm, it's the same thing. Uh, we're constantly, we set our hearts and we set our minds and we set our actions according to what Jesus Christ has done and he wants us to think is don't go so earthly minded set your minds on things that are above that's our real home and how often how many times do we have to set our minds there again because we just get so uh, distracted by the world around us so much is going on but I have found especially in the last little while if I'm setting my mind on what's going on in the world politically after a while it's like my actions it, I keep going back to that because it's stirring up too much of the of the natural mind of what's going on on planet earth and again, so this word especially is going to be all the more important for us is to set your mind on things above. Because God isn't taken by surprise. He knows what's, he knows what's coming down. We don't act irresponsibly. And yes, we need to be aware of all the things, but that's really not the kingdom that we're plugging into all the time. Or we're going to find out we'll give in to our old nature once again and we'll give in to the fear and we'll give in to pretty soon. That's what we're all talking about. And so this word is saying... Set your cruise control, people, where our destination is glory, where Jesus Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Amen. And that's where we're all headed. We're all getting there. Glory to God. This, this, this place, earth, is not our home. And any time, Lord, rapture practice, right? It's like any time. Glory to God. That would be a, it would be a good time to go. But in the meantime, set your hearts there. So set your heart, set your affections. We have to set our minds there, but we also have to set our affections because Jesus said where your, where your heart is, there your treasure is going to be. And, you know, it can be... It can be anything, again, distraction, uh, just even I want my heart to be more and more, my affection to be more and more on Jesus, on the true meaning of Christmas than getting caught up into all this dollar store tinsel and stuff like that where it's like are we really going there and are we just accumulating piles of stuff and where do we even put all this stuff it's like no thanks yes we can stay balanced and celebrate uh, and God wants to 
give us good, good things. We're allowed to taste and see that God is good and celebrate. We're the ones who have reason to celebrate, amen, at Christmas. So God wants us to enjoy all these things, and yet he doesn't want our hearts to be on all this temporary stuff. Uh, set our affections on there. So he says, I want your heads uh, to, be, to be set on things that are above where Christ is seated. And you too are seated with him in heavenly places. Amen. And then all of a sudden the fear goes, so what am I so afraid of? Then And set our hearts, our affections, and then set our hands, our actions need to be in correspondence with that. Then what really does matter? If this is not our home and this is really where it's at, then sharing Christ becomes the primary focus. Amen? As he wants to populate heaven. Plunder hell and populate heaven. Glory to God. So there's an important word that might come to your mind throughout the week is just set your heart, set your head, set your hands to be doing what really, really, really matters. And then it's going to be putting to death automatically. We won't have to concentrate on don't be lustful, don't be greedy, don't be this and don't be that. Uh, you know, rules, rules, and rules as if that's going to keep... Uh, no, we're not focused on that. What are we focused on? What are these qualities that mean so much to the Lord where he's saying, now I want your actions to correspond with your belief, your heart and your affections, your head and your heart. I want your hands to be about doing this. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, and we need to just not rush past that. What is the Lord when he sees you? He says, holy and dearly loved. Amen. That that's who we are. We can just have a drink like um, Lisa was sharing this morning. Have a drink of, ah, oh, that's how the Lord feels about me. Like he really wants to just hang out with me more than anything else. And so we need to take a good breath of heavenly air, so to speak. Uh, to clear our heads before we're ready to move in the right direction. But then it says, it's this putting off. And I thought of bringing some dress up clothes today, but I didn't. But I just thought, you know, the word here, the picture is so awesome. It says, rid yourself of all that yuck. Take off the muddy boots that are, you know, you've been mudging and trudging around down here on all the circumstances. Take off those filthy garments of shame and, and uh, uh, condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. And we have to literally sometimes, do you ever have to shake yourself off where you just go, you've been around it and it's just had an effect and it's like, i got to rid myself of all of that. That's not who I am and that's not who I choose to be. But then it gives this other word picture, clothe yourself with these characteristics that we could literally have a choice to choose to come in line with this new nature and, and you put it on and it's a choice of your will and maybe you even feel a little bit fake and a little bit phony at first because you're going well I'm really not feeling it and if ever I can give you a spiritual truth to draw application to, is your feelings are like the caboose at the end of a train. Whenever you hear the train go past your house, remember feelings is the caboose. Your feelings, how you're feeling, is just going to follow what you're thinking about and where your affections are. For where your heart is, there your treasure is. So what you've been thinking about and what you've been, uh, what you've been setting your affections on, your feelings are going to follow. And so a lot of times we find ourselves feeling negative and not feeling like we're genuinely praising the Lord. There's lots of times I'm up here and I'm praising the Lord with all of my heart and all my soul and all my strength because the Word tells me to do that. And I might not be feeling it. But the word tells me to lift up my hands and to lift up my voice and to love them with all my strength. So the more I do and choose and put on this new nature, the feelings line up. And it's like, ha, I'm feeling a lot better than I did when I first walked in here today. Amen. And then you find a powerful principle 
A powerful principle. So if you want to stir up joy, the word says to stir up your most holy faith. Faith comes from hearing and hearing the word. So we know what to do. How do we put these things on? You purposely put on the praise and worship. You purposely get into the word or listen to an inspiring uh, preaching of the God's word and you find, ah, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling a little more hopeful. God is in control after all. And then we can literally put on compassion. Now you have to allow yourself, cultivate compassion. Cultiv uh, uh, compassion is something you have to cultivate. If I, what, is cult what is compassion? Compassion literally means I'm feeling in my gut what somebody else is going through. I land up purposely cultivating uh, the feeling to where I can identify with that person. Jesus was moved by compassion because he was able to put himself in a, another person's shoes. When he saw the multitudes and they said they're hungry, he was moved with compassion because he too would get hungry and he too would get tired and he too, he could identify with those people and that is something the word is telling us to cultivate that compassion, to literally put it on. Feel what somebody else is feeling and saying, oh, hon, are you tired here? You sit, let me do that. That's moving with compassion. That's something we can literally put on, clothe ourselves with that. And then kindness. Kindness, yeah, again, it's not a feeling. It's something you do. You do something. You act out of kindness for somebody else. Oh, that was really kind of you. Thank you. And how that warms one another's heart. And you land up putting all this new nature together, and you go, ah, we're creating an atmosphere, uh, an a, a heavenly atmosphere, an atmosphere in our homes, an atmosphere in our church uh, that is very conducive with the way heaven feels. And that's what the Lord wants us to be like so that when others come into our homes and come in contact with us, they see this new nature in operation and it's like, wow, that person's different. How kind is the world? Not very Amen. If they can cut in and be the first one in line. They are. I think of this one guy, Joe, this week at the grocery store. As soon as he saw me, he went like this. And he allowed me to go first. And I thought, oh, thanks, Joe. That was really kind of you. Uh, you know, kindness just goes a whole lot way. And I think, you know, joy can't help but follow kindness. When someone's kind, it's just like the world just is a little nicer of a place. And then humility. Think of yourself with sober judgment, the word says. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Humility that uh, it expresses and exalts somebody else and celebrates somebody else. Amen? And, and allows ourselves, even as Jesus did with humility, he didn't count equality with God himself, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, put on the towel, and became a servant, started washing the disciples' feet, and Peter's going like, what are you doing? And he's going, Peter, let me just wash your feet, and he's going, I'm, I'm showing you an incredible object lesson. You guys have been arguing about who's the most important, who's going to be where, who's got the most gifting, who cast out that demon. You did not. I did that. Like, they were arguing. Jesus would catch them a couple of times. Hey, guys, what are you talking about? And so humility is emptying yourself and thinking of others. Amen. So it is a beautiful thing. Humility is a beautiful thing, don't you think? Pride is really stinky. It's to think, well, at least I never did this. It's like, okay. It's just very stinky. Anyways, we've all, we all just have to say, Lord, I choose humility because it's not being very fun being around somebody who's prideful. And then gentleness, to be gentle. And I, what comes to my mind is not so much physical gentleness, for sure, but the Bible says a gentle answer turns away wrath. A gentle answer. So when someone's really kind of up there, and maybe they're acting in their flesh, in their old nature, it, it, just to speak in a gentle tone. It's like, it's okay, I got it, hon. 
right? Just that quiet answer, that gentle answer, turns away wrath. And then uh, what's the next one here? Patience. Patience is so important in a home. Again, it, it just reduces the stress level. I just thought of how many things in our old nature is this hurried and stress and we got to go and aren't you ready? And this elevated voices and and just to bring in, in the nature of Christ and um, be patient with one another. Uh, just to bring in that atmosphere of patience. It's okay. And bear with each other. Uh, bear with each other's weaknesses. Uh, be forbearing. Be patient. Because we all have those days or those moments that kind of, you know, one minute we've got our cruise control and it's a new nature. And then sometimes it just this one thing. It could be a phone call. Like, what happened there? Because something just changed in your whole demeanor and everything. And so the word says just be, forbear with each other. Amen. Give that person a chance to kind of reorient themselves. Bear with each other. Don't be quick to say, uh, I've got a few lines, but I won't say them because they wouldn't be good on the pulpit. But, you know, um, you know, we, we come back. We've got these comebacks. Uh, and God's word is saying, don't, don't be like that. Don't be quick to... to, to jump on that person when that person just having a moment to reorient themselves. Bear with each other in your weaknesses. All of these things are so easy to talk about. <laughs> and then we go home and we do like, who let the dog in? Not that we have a dog, but it's like, uh, you know, it just can, it can, life can just happen like that. The phone! <laughs> we can just be like that. That old nature just seems so ready to to, to jump back into the driver's seat. And then it says forgive. And let's talk about forgiveness. How many times do you have to forgive that person you live with? How many times? It's like, honestly, how many times? And what, especially if they don't even ask for forgiveness, right? So it's like the word says, hey, hey, Jesus, hey, I got, I got it. I know the number seven. Jesus likes that. How about Jesus? How many times should I forgive my brother? I know. I know. Seven times, right? If my brother sins against me seven times today. How do you like that answer, Jesus? And he's going, uh, mm -mm. 70 times seven. 70 times seven? How many times is that person going to do that jump on you or whatever, act in the flesh. How many times do you forgive? And so that's what forgiveness is. And I really think we talk about it in the church a lot, but how many find it's, a, again, it takes your new nature and to just say, Jesus going, uh, just a minute here. How would you be doing if it wasn't for my forgiveness? Jesus said, if you don't forgive your brother, I can't forgive you. Amen? And somehow we think that certain things are just unforgivable. Well, I've heard the recent teaching, and I thought, man, that is, sits right in me. Jesus says if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us. And he buries it in the deepest sea, and he remembers it no more. And I've heard some teaching even this week is how do you forgive when you can't forget? Well, Again, our new nature has equipment that is enabled by his grace to do that which we could never do on our own. The greatest testimonies of restored life, restored marriages, is all hinging on true, biblical, Jesus kind of forgiveness. And that forgiveness, it's not like... Uh, Oh, if somebody said, what's the matter? You don't remember this, this, and this? It's like, yeah, it's kind of there like a distant bad dream. But you know what happens when you have a bad dream and your heart is pounding? <gasps> How many times, hon, I get a bad dream? And Gil goes, Anita, you're dreaming. <laughs> and then I'm going, oh, still feels very real. It still feels very real. But you, you, you give yourself a, a, a minute to settle and you're going, it was just a dream. 
right? It was just a dream. And there's, I've experienced this, so I have a testimony, and I have a few friends and a few uh, young couples in, in, that I know about their testimonies. And it was a decision they made to not only forgive, but to forget. To ask God to do a miracle. They realized they had to have a miracle done in their heart in order to live the way the Bible is saying, the way Jesus is, to truly love that person and not treat them as if they still got a record against them. Forgive us our trespasses, even as we forgive those who are indebted to us. So if that person is still in debt... <laughs> You're always walking around like you're still in debt, trying to pay a debt that you can never pay. And maybe if you do enough kind things, and maybe if you say a nice thing, and maybe if you go away on enough holidays and you're always nice to that person, maybe after 12 years, they'll let you out of debtor's prison. That's not biblical forgiveness. And believe me, I've got a test. We've all got testimonies where it's like, I'm not asking you that you can or say this is even humanly possible. Some things that people have, have, uh, have suffered, I think of Corrie Ten Boom going back to the Second World War where she was made to march naked in front of a whole bunch of soldiers and, and ridiculed. They were, it was horrible in these concentration camps. And she, as a Christian born again, would do these talks, the motivational talks to people. And this, this, army sergeant came up to her and she recognized he was one of the prison guards. And he stuck his hand out to her and said, Corey, could you forgive me? And she said she froze. She froze because this was one of her very own captors a wanting forgiveness. But he had come to know Jesus and he was in the audience and he was asking for forgiveness. You wouldn't ask somebody, like, how do you expect someone like that? How do you expect a, a Joyce Myers to forgive her father for raping her how many times as a teenager? How do you dare even ask somebody to do that? So it's impossible in our old nature. Jesus isn't asking us to do something in our old nature. He's asking you to take off a gift, a grace, from the very throne where Jesus Christ is seated and let him do a miracle in your heart. And then you can say, yes, I can shake your hand. Yes, we can have a healthy relationship. It's all gone. It's all under the blood. Jesus has done a miracle in my heart, and you won't hear about it anymore. That's the kind of forgiveness that the Word of God is talking about, and until we experience that, we should be experiencing that. If you've never faced something so humongous as these other examples, there'll be plenty of things where it feels like, I can't. You can't ask me to do that. We're not asking you to do that. We're asking you to allow Jesus to do that in you. And then you can say, it's supernatural. Everything we're talking about in the Word of God is supernatural. So that one, too, is supernatural. Amen. It's, it's how do you explain true forgiveness to the world? They don't, they don't have any reference point. We have a reference point since Christ died. For us, since he was buried, since he was raised to newness of life, since he ever lives to make intercession for you, since we are part of one body, since all that Jesus Christ has done, ha, now I can step into a brand new place. That's what Paul said. Hey, the old is gone. I once was, and he can talk about it. You want to know what I once was? This is what I once was. But since, since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, 
Amen. It's a brand new thing. It's a brand new day. It's a, it's a supernatural thing. And so then we want to close with, and over all these virtues, because they all come together, and they're all wrapped up in Jesus. And if you really want a beautiful picture of it, you just have to look at the last week of Jesus and the, his death on the cross, where he showed all these things. Compassion. John, behold your mother. Behold your son, compassion, kindness, love, forgiveness. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. All these virtues, it says above all of them, bind them all together with love. Supernatural, agape, unconditional love. Thank you, Lord, because we've been recipients of that love. Which, as in the Passion Translation says, which marks true spiritual maturity. And so how do we want to learn to grow up? How do we want to learn to get from glory to glory? How do we learn to be possessors? Not until we possess these things are we going to be able to possess what's out there. Amen. And we are possessors of the mind of Christ, of the peace of Christ. Amen. That's as far as I'm going. Um, I was going to end all because it does say and do all in the name of Jesus, but we're going to save that for next week. So if we can have the praise and worship team come again. Um, if you're struggling, and that's okay. If that's okay to struggle because I just want to share. There was one time in a Baptist church when I first was saved, and it was a Dobson thing about marriage, and it was describing um, men's sexuality compared to, to a woman, and they were saying about a guy, you could be at loggerheads all day, but then the moment you put on your get ready for bed, all of a sudden he's all there. And I remember saying, not in a very soft voice, if that's men, I hate them. And that was the level of hurt and anger that was in my heart at that time. And I don't think I could have subdued that old nature if I tried. But I'm so thankful there was people there. It's like, it's okay to struggle. And it's okay to be real. And it's okay to say, I can't. It's like I've, I've seen people be so angry and so hurt. And it's like, I get it. But church is a place where God is saying, it's a safe place. This is the place we get to bring our junk. So bring your junk. You come to the right place. I brought my junk, and I continue to bring my junk to Jesus because he's good. At, he's a good, he can deal with our junk. Amen, John? He deals with our junk. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You guys just want to join us. And I just want to invite anybody, if you want to come up to the front, um, we'll just recognize the distancing, but if you just really want to come and be on your knees or whatever, the altar is always open.